Unit 6.3, Beam Stress, the Shear Formula. In this unit, we have focused on the outcome, demonstrate the ability to calculate normal and shear stress and deflection in beams. In this lesson, we will focus on how to calculate shear stress at any point on the cross-section of a beam using the shear formula. First, let's introduce the shear formula. The formula is shown. It is tau, the shear stress, is equal to VQ divided by I and T. Now let's define these terms. Tau is the shear stress at a point on a cross-section. V is the internal resultant shear force that is acting at the point where we are evaluating shear stress. We can get the internal resultant shear force from the shear diagram. I is the moment of inertia of the full cross-section about the axis that is perpendicular to the internal shear force. T is the member width perpendicular to the shear force direction at the point where stress is being evaluated. Q is equal to this expression here, y bar prime times a prime. We will spend some time defining these terms in just a moment. I will demonstrate how to use the shear formula with a simple example. Let's consider a simply supported beam with a single point load applied at its center. The dimensions are shown and the magnitude of the load is shown. If I was to draw the shear diagram, it would look like this. At the left end, we would have a 50 kilonewton uh, increase in the shear diagram as a result of the uh, reaction at the left side. It would remain constant to the center of the beam where the 100 kilonewton point load is applied, taking us down to negative 50 kilonewtons. It will remain constant until the right end of the beam where we get to the other reaction and bump back up 50 kilonewtons to zero. Now if we were to take a, an imaginary cut through this cross-section of this beam at the point shown, the internal resultant shear at that point would be 50 kilonewtons. We could see that on the diagram. Now if I look now at the cross-section of the beam, it has a rectangular shape and the dimensions are given. It's 30 millimeters wide, 50 millimeters tall, and here the green arrow is that internal resultant shear force, which is equal to 50 kilonewtons. I'm now going to apply the shear formula to calculate the shear stress at this point B. Now, the shear stress varies across the cross-section, and we'll look at how it varies here at the end of this example. But for now, I just want to calculate shear at point B. Now, it turns out that the shear at point B is the same uh, value as the shear is anywhere on this dotted line. We can state that on a line, on a cross-section, which is perpendicular to the shear force, the shear stress at any point along that line is uniform, and it can be calculated with this equation. Now, the first step is to find V. V is the internal resultant shear force acting on the cross-section, and it is 50 kilonewtons, or 50,000 newtons. Next, let's find I the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is the moment of inertia for the whole cross-section about the neutral axis, which is perpendicular to the internal resultant shear force. And because it is a rectangular cross-section, we will use the equation for moment of inertia, the base times the height cubed divided by 12. That's shown here. The base is 30 millimeters, or 0 0.03 meters. The height is 0 0.05 meters. It's cubed divided by 12. Next, let's find T. T represents the width of the member perpendicular to the shear direction at the point where we're evaluating our shear stress. So that is, we're evaluating shear stress at point B. So we look at the width of the cross section at point B is 30 millimeters, or 0 0.03 meters. Now let's talk about Q. As previously mentioned, Q is equal to this expression here, A prime times Y bar prime. Let's begin by talking about A prime. A prime is equal to the area that is above or below 
this dotted black line, which passes through the point B, where we are evaluating shear stress. So first, I'm going to look at the area above the dotted line. It is shaded here in red. Its area is the area of this rectangle. Its base dimension is 30 millimeters, or 0 0.03 meters. Its height dimension is 10 millimeters, or 0 0.01 meters. That is our A prime. The next variable is Y bar prime. Y bar prime is the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of our A prime area. The A prime area is the red box, and its centroid is right in the middle. The distance from the centroid to the neutral axis is, in this case, 20 millimeters, or 0 0.02 meters. We can then calculate Q. It's equal to A prime times Y bar prime, and we get this value here. I previously mentioned that we could also calculate the value for Q using A prime as the area below the dotted line. Let's demonstrate that. Now let's say we chose this area below the dotted line as our A prime. Its area would be the base of this rectangle, 0 0.03 meters, and the height of this red shaded area is 0 0.04 meters, 40 millimeters. So you see our A prime area is obviously different uh, if we take the area below the dotted line. Y bar prime is the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of this A prime area. The centroid is right here. That's 20 millimeters up from the bottom. Uh, that means our Y bar prime is equal to 5 millimeters, or 0 0.05 meters. Multiply those together, we get the same value for Q that we got when we took the area above the dotted line that passed through point B. So we always have two options for calculating Q. Uh, we can use the area above the line where our shear stress is being evaluated, or the area below. In either case, the area changes typically, and the Y bar prime will also change, and either way we get the same value for Q. Now if we plug that value for Q into the shear formula, we get a value at point B. The shear stress is equal to 32 megapascals. Now let's consider another point on this cross section. Let's consider point C, which is 20 millimeters down from the top of the cross section. Now I've written the shear formula to calculate shear stress at point C, and we can see that values for V, the internal resultant shear force, the value for I, the moment of inertia for the cross section, and T, the width of the cross section, uh, where we are evaluating our shear stress at point C, are all the same as they were when we calculated the shear stress at point B. Now, this is always going to be true for internal resultant shear force and the moment of inertia. If we have a cross section where the width is changing, then, then T will change depending on where we calculate shear stress. In this case, for a rectangle, T is the width that's always going to be the same wherever we calculate shear stress on this cross section. But Q will change, as we shall see. So uh, we can calculate Q with this expression. We can take for our A prime the area above or below the dotted line. I will choose the area above the dotted line. That area is uh, a width of 30 millimeters, or 0.3 meters, with a height of 20 millimeters, or 0 0.02 meters. The Y bar prime is the distance from its centroid to the neutral axis, which is 15 millimeters, or 0 0.015 meters. And we can calculate a value for Q. It's slightly larger than the value was at point B. Plugging it into the shear formula, we get an, a value for shear stress at point C equal to 48 megapascals. It has increased from B to C. So now let's consider the shear stress at point D, which happens to be right on the neutral axis. Again, our values for internal resultant shear force, moment of inertia, and width at the point where we're evaluating shear stress are all the same. The only number that's going to change for us in the shear formula is Q. For A prime, we will take the area above, which is equal to the area below in this case, uh, the dotted line where we're evaluating shear stress at point D. That area is going to be 0 0.03 meters, 
wide, 0.025 meters tall. Y bar prime is the distance from the centroid to the neutral axis. That's going to be half of 25 millimeters or 12.5 millimeters or 0.0125 meters. And we can calculate Q equal to this value here, which is the largest Q we've seen yet. Plug that back into the shear formula and we can get a value for shear stress at point D on the neutral axis of 50 megapascals. You can see we've increased again from B to C and now from C to D. And it turns out that at the neutral axis we will find our maximum shear stress. If I now go below the neutral axis, say 5 millimeters down, uh, I will calculate uh, a value for shear stress that will be equal to the value at C for this symmetric cross-section. That's because the Q value at a point 5 millimeters down below D is the same as it was at point C. So let's calculate now the shear stress at point A, right up here at the top of our cross-section. And again, V, I, and T are all the same. Let's calculate uh, the value for Q. Now if I take A prime as the area above the dotted line, it's zero. If A prime is zero, then Q is zero. But what if I took the area below the dotted line? That's also an option. If I did that, the area would be the whole cross-section. A prime would be the area of the whole cross-section, 30 millimeters wide, 50 millimeters tall. Y bar prime would be the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid, but the centroid of that cross-section lies on the neutral axis, which is always true. That means the distance is zero. So y bar prime is zero and q is zero. If we plug in a value of zero for q in the shear formula, the shear stress will come out to be zero. This is always going to be true. The shear stress will always be zero at the top uh, of the member, and therefore it must always be zero at the bottom of the member. So now I show the shear stress at points A through G. And we can see that shear stress is zero at A, it reaches a maximum at the neutral axis, and then returns to zero again at G. And we can see from these values that it's a symmetrical distribution. And this is what it looks like. The shear force is being spread over the cross-sectional area. It's small up near the top, and it gets larger towards the neutral axis, and then begins to decrease again. If we summed up all the shear stress over the entire area, it would be equal to this 50 kilonewton force. And the distribution happens to be a parabolic one, with a maximum at the neutral axis, and zero at the extreme ends. Let's consider another example. Here is a cantilever beam with a load of 200 kilonewtons applied at the free end. If we were to draw the shear diagram at the wall, we'd have 200 kilonewtons uh, upward, and we remain at constant 200 kilonewtons across the beam, and then drop down back to zero at the right end where the load is applied. And if we were to take a cut through the beam, we would see that uh, the internal resultant force here at the uh, surface of the cut is equal to 200 kilonewtons. And let's say the cross section of this beam is an I shape, which is pretty common for beams. Uh, and we want to evaluate shear stress at these five points. A and E are on the uh, top and bottom edges of the beam. B and D are right at the point where the flange piece intersects the vertical web piece. And C, we'll say, is right on the neutral axis. And we're going to use the shear formula to calculate shear stress. Now, uh, in the shear formula, the first term we have is V. That's the internal resultant shear force. We'll say that's 200 kilonewtons. And the moment of inertia will be the moment of inertia of this whole section. And that can be calculated by taking the moment of inertia of a rectangular block that is uh, drawn around the perimeter of the beam and subtract out these two rectangular blocks on either side of the web. We can do that because both of those shapes share the same neutral axis. And we can get a moment of inertia uh, as shown. First of all, let's consider points A and E. They lie on the extreme ends of 
the cross section, and they will have a shear stress equal to zero. Because we can consider that Q for each of them, if we consider the area above point A or the area of the cross section below point E, is going to be zero. So Q is zero, and therefore shear stress is zero. Now let's consider point B. Now the area above point B, that's our A prime area in our Q formula, uh, that's the easier area to calculate because the area below point B is this inverted T shape and that would be a little bit more uh, computational effort. So let's consider the area above. The area is the area of this blue rectangle, a base dimension of 0.2 meters, a height of 0.02 meters, and the y-bar prime is the distance from the centroid of that blue rectangle to the neutral axis. It's 150 millimeters from the neutral axis up to point B and 10 more millimeters up to the centroid. That's 160 millimeters or 0.16 meters. And we get a good value for Q sub B. 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth meters cubed. Right at point B, we get an abrupt change in T. Just above point B, the width, T is the width of the flange, which is 200 millimeters. Right below point B, it's the T value is the width of the web, which is only 20 millimeters. So let's consider both. We'll take the shear stress at just above B, I'll call it B plus, we'll put in the value for T of 0.2 meters. And that gives us a value for shear stress of 2.56 megapascals. Now for the point just below B, I'll call it B minus, the T value for T is 0 0.02 meters. That gives us a shear stress of 25.6 megapascals. So we see a considerable jump in shear stress when we go from a large flange to a small web. And at point D, uh, we will get the same values because this is cross-section is symmetrical about the neutral axis. So now let's consider point C. For the sh calculating the shear stress at point C, we will use the area above or below, the line drawn through point C, and the area above is shown by this uh, blue uh, T. We can break this area into two separate rectangular areas. We'll call this one 1, we'll call this one 2. And we can calculate our value for Q for calculating shear stress at point C first by taking the area, that's our A prime, of piece 1. That is this rectangular block that represents the flange. And multiply it by its y bar prime, which is from the centroid to the neutral axis, which we previously found was 0 0.16 meters. Then we will add to it the product of the A prime y bar prime for piece 2. Its area, the area of piece 2, is 20 millimeters wide, or 0.02 meters, times 150 millimeters tall, or 0.15 meters. Uh, and its y bar prime value is from its centroid to the neutral axis, which is half of 150 millimeters, or 0 0.075 meters. And we get this value for Q, which we can then put into the shear formula and calculate the maximum shear stress, which is at the neutral axis, is 34.6 megapascals. Here I've listed the values of shear stress. We can see that it starts at zero at the top, increases, there's a dramatic jump as we move from the flange to the web, and then we continue to increase to our maximum at the neutral axis at point C, and then it's symmetrical below that. If we can visualize what that shear stress looks like, we can replace the shear force, which is acting down on this cross section, as a, a spread out shear stress over the surface. Small at the top, increasing to the neutral axis, then decreasing to the bottom. And the distribution would look something like this. It's parabolic from A to B, then the, the abrupt jump, then it continues in its parabolic form to a maximum of the neutral axis, and symmetrical below. And we're done.